ago. In the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 43, the people had just come out of the upper room and the Spirit of God had fallen upon them. And the Bible says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. Underline that in your Bible. All who believed were together and had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continually, daily, in one accord. Someone say, one accord. Look at this. In the temple... So they were together in the temple, but then also in breaking bread from house to house, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And look what the miracle of the Lord is. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Can we give God a praise for his word? For his word. Amen. Thank you. We've been in a series entitled Hearts on Fire. Today, I want to take a little bit of time to talk to you about House on Fire. House on Fire. In 1857, there was a 46-year-old man named Jeremiah Lemphere who lived in New York City. And Jeremiah, he loved the Lord tremendously, but he didn't feel that he could do much for the Lord until he began to feel a burden for the lost so he accepted an invitation from his, from, a, from his church to be an inner city missionary. So in July of 1857, he started walking up and down the streets of New York, passing out tracts and talking to people about Jesus. But he wasn't having any success. So then God put it in his heart to try prayer. So what he did is he printed up a bunch of tracts and he passed them out to anyone and everyone who he met. He invited anyone who wanted to come to his church on Fulton Street in New York City from 12 to 1 on a Wednesday just to pray. He passed out hundreds and hundreds of flyers and put up posters everywhere he could. <clears throat> and Wednesday came, and at noon, he went to the church to pray, and nobody showed up. So Jeremiah got on his knees, and he started praying. And for two weeks... Someone say two weeks. He prayed and no one came. How, how, how many times, you know, sometimes we, we get weary in prayer. But someone say two weeks. He prayed and nobody showed up. So Jeremiah got on his knees and he kept on praying. For two weeks he prayed. No one showed up. Then the third week he began to pray. For 30 minutes he prayed by himself when finally five other people walked in. The next week. 20 people came. The next week, between 30 and 40 people came. They then decided to meet every day to pray from 12 to 1 to pray for the city. And before long, a few ministers started coming and they said, we need to start this at our churches. Within six months, there were over 5,000 prayer groups meeting every day in New York City. And then the word and the spirit of prayer spread all over the country. Prayer meetings were started in Philadelphia, Detroit, Washington, D.C. And by 1859, in just two years, 15,000 cities in America were having downtown prayer meetings every day at noon. And thousands came to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. I think we should give God a praise for that. Amen. The, the, great, thing about, the great thing about this revival... And if you're listening, I want you to hear this. The great thing about this revival is there was not a famous preacher associated with it. It was all started by one man who was willing to pray. In the book of Acts, the fire that God started in the upper room was transmitted into the lives of 120 people. So 120 people gathered in the upper room to pray. And that fire from heaven fell on 120. Next, it was transmitted into their homes. We read about this in the book of Acts, right? They broke bread from house to house. They began to experience miracles in their own home. 
And then later it went from being in the upper room to being in the disciples to being in their home to being in their city. Let me say something to you about fire is when a fire is channeled, it will not be quenched. But the sure way to kill a fire is not to allow it to spread. What we want to begin to see is the fire of revival spread. When God gives you revival, how many know it starts personal? But then that revival needs to get into your home. It needs to get into your house. It needs to get into the rooms of your home. It needs to get into your living room. It needs to get into your kitchen. It needs to get in your bedroom. It needs to get into your backyard. It needs to get into your front yard. Come on, somebody. Fire has a desire to spread. Let's talk about the upper room for a second. Ten days of prayer. When did the fire fall in the upper room? When the disciples had gathered together, 120 disciples gathered together for simply 10 days of prayer. Imagine 10 days of plowing, 10 days of praying, 10 days of calling an open heaven, 10 days of seeking God. Then the fire fell. It only took 10 days of prayer to create an environment that not only changed their life, but an environment that literally changed the entire world. And what am I saying to you this morning is that as we've been plowing through prayer and worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, God has been breaking the fallow ground of our hearts. What is fallow ground? Listen, if you've been here, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't been here, you need to experience this. Fallow ground is the hard covering of a man's heart. It's the hard soil on a field. When you go out to a field that hasn't produced fruit in a very long time, it begins to harden. It begins to get hard on the top shell. And so what the farmer has to do is he has to spend time breaking the top layer of the dirt so that the seed can be planted and the seed can be watered. As we have been praying, as we've been seeking God, as we've been worshiping every Sunday, every Wednesday, every day of the week the Lord has been breaking the hardness of the heart guess what when the hardness breaks then the seeds can be planted when the seed is planted then the seed can be watered when the seed is watered then it can produce a great harvest I don't know about you but I'm believing God for a great harvest in my life see it's undeniable what is taking place In people's lives. See, a supernatural people, a supernatural church is always the product of a supernatural environment. The upper room in the the New Testament is a picture of the valley of dry bones. When Ezekiel prophesied to the dry bones, the Bible says they assembled. Bones came together. Shoulders, knees, hips were relocated when the word of God was prophesied through Ezekiel. But I want to tell you that it wasn't until the Lord told Ezekiel to prophesy to the wind, to prophesy to the wind that those dry bones became animated. What am I saying to you this morning is that the upper room is a New Testament photograph of the valley of dry bones. Listen, they were together, but there was no power. They were assembled, but there was no power until the Bible says it came in like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And those bones came back to life. There are people here this morning that the spirit of revival has brought you back to life. God is bringing you back to to life and if you are not back to life yet open up your heart and let the spirit of the living God begin to breathe in you again oh my God. the spirit that brought those dry bones back to life the breath or the wind of God that raised Christ from the dead was the same breath that filled the disciples in the upper room it was the same breath that caused the barren to give birth in the Old Testament it's the same breath that brought the dry bones and turned them into an exceedingly great army it's the same breath that God has released in your life and what am I saying to you it's the same breath that God wants to release in your home The breath of God for the revival to burn. The breath of God wants to breathe on your home. The early church 
was a supernatural church filled with supernatural people, but they were built in a supernatural environment. They were the product of a praying environment filled with unusual supernatural power from heaven. I want to tell you that the character of fire, the very character of fire is to spread. The very character of fire is to spread. How does fire spread? How did fire spread here in the up, upper room experience in Acts 2? Well, the first thing is this. How does fire spread? Number one, write this down. It always spreads through the hunger and the thirst of God's people. Where there's hunger and where there's thirst, there can be revival. Where there's hunger and thirst. Many of us have been learning that hunger and thirst comes out of pain, doesn't it? Comes out of pain. Comes out of painful experiences. I've been reading, um, you know, the revival of religion by Charles Finney. And in the beginning, he talks about how before revival broke out through him, he was going to church one day, look at me, and he saw seven coffins, coffins that day going to the graveyard. Seven coffins that day going to the graveyard. What had happened is that cholera had broken out in the city's water. Look at me. Don't read your name. Look at me. They put up the wrong slide. The water in the city became affected. And people begin to drink the water and they begin to become sick. And in one day, he saw seven coffins go to the graveyard until one day Finney woke up and he himself was sick from the very same water. He was sick almost to the point of death. But through his sickness, he began to pray for God to heal him. And the power of God hit his life and he was totally healed. What am I saying to you this morning is I'm saying that for revival to burn, the people of God must pivot their pain. They must pivot their pain to a hunger and a thirst for revival and the power of God to break out in their life. Listen, when you are in pain, you don't praise, you pray. When you are in pain, you don't preach, you don't do ministry. That's what so many people, they want revival. They think revival is going to come through doing ministry and through singing song. It doesn't come that way. Revival comes when you begin to get on in your knees in prayer and you begin to anguish for God to pivot your pain into purpose. Someone say hunger. Say thirst. We see this in the early church that there was a hunger and a thirst for the power of God, there was a hunger and thirst for teaching. There was a hunger and thirst for fellowship. As they broke into their houses, miracles continued to flow when they were together in fellowship. The word here is the word koinonia. Koinonia, the greatest earmark of revival is hunger, thirst, brotherly love, fellowship, koinonia. Koinonia is, means fellowship, but it's something deeper than friendship. Koinonia is not f friendship. Koinonia is not Facebook friendship. <laughs> See, the church can't have revival until it stops being so cold. The fire of God doesn't pull us apart. The fire of God brings us together. The word koinonia is something deeper than friendship. It means sharing, partnership, brotherhood. It means this. It means the sharing of a common life. The sharing of a common life. Having the things of God, the move of God in common with your brother and your sister. There was a hunger that came for them to be together. Mm. When revival breaks out, you want to be with the people of God. When revival breaks out, there is a hunger to come into a shared spirit, a shared life with other people who have been impacted, who are experiencing that change. There is a hunger and a thirst not just to come and be an audience, but to get into the army. 
we find here that they were hungry and thirsty. And one of the major keys of revival is partnership. What we find is that they needed one another. They needed one another because Jesus said, if two or three touch and agree on anything, he says, I will do it. If two or three touch on anything, I will do it. They needed one another because if they were going to see the power of God move, they needed to touch and agree with the right people. Right. See, I believe that partnership is what keeps the fire burning. It's coming into a group of people that have been kindled and rekindled. It's coming into the midst of the fire. And together they discovered the power of corporate prayer. Revival is personal. However, it's often birthed through a spirit of corporate prayer. Corporate prayer. 120 people gathered together in a room. Man, think about it. Gathered together in an upper room. Locked the door, shut the windows. Took on the spirit of Jacob. They said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Jesus said, don't leave that room until the fire of the Holy Spirit falls upon you. And they came together in corporate agreement, home of Thumadon, unanimous agreement, and said, we will not leave this place until heaven opens up and the fire of the Holy Spirit falls down on our life. And God came through. So for fire to spread, there's a hunger and a thirst. Secondly, the Bible says that they broke bread from house to house. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, there's a continuation of this first quality in that they spent all of their time together. The word koinonia also means the sharing of physical and spiritual nourishment. When they were together, the Bible says they had all things in common. They shared all things. And what it simply means is they met each other's needs. They met each other's needs. See, one of the greatest enemies to an outpouring of God's spirit is a grudge. It's a spirit of unforgiveness. And when a spirit of unforgiveness comes in and bitterness comes into a person's life, that person doesn't have to be excommunicated from a move of God. They excommunicate themselves from a move of God. Because the nature of revival is not to be divided, but to share. To come together in all things to come together in the victories, but to come together in the spiritual battles. You can sense that God, as he lights a heart on fire, he heals our hearts. He burns away the bitterness. He burns away the grudges. He burns away the anger. You don't bring up the past. If you still bring up the past, brothers and sisters, there's bitterness still in your heart. Past offenses, past hurts, past pains, past things said to you. There's bitterness in your heart that only the spirit of revival, that only the fires of revival, that only the spirit of prayer can heal. But when God heals you, when the power of God burns those yokes out of your heart, he uproots those seeds of unforgiveness. There's a new anointing. There's a new hunger. There's a new thirst. There's a new desire. I didn't have that in my notes, but the Holy Spirit is moving through this sermon. Who believes that the Holy Spirit, who came not to hear the voice, but who comes to church to hear the voice behind the voice? The Lord heals us so that we could share and have all things in common. When we get together, we meet each other's needs. We feast on our friendships. We feast on our 
on the presence and power of the Holy Ghost. We, we're not isolated. Can I hear an amen? amen? How does this fire spread? Thirdly, there was an emphasis on power. Whew. And this is why I feel the Holy Ghost just, just get me. There, when they gathered together, hear me and hear me clear, brothers and sisters, there was an emphasis on power. Whew. I want you to say it. I want everybody to get on the count of three. Say it real loud. Say power on three. One, two, three. Power. That's what I'm talking about. That when they came together, the Bible says the power of God became manifest. The power of God was present. That the miracles were not only being done in the midst of the apostles, but the miracles were being done as a result of the apostles' teaching. Woo. In other words, the anointing you feel here is the anointing you could take home with you. Come on, come on give the Lord at least one praise today. I'm... I'm doing my best. I feel the Lord has spoken to me. The anointing that is here is the anointing that you could take with you. The power that flows at this altar is the power that could flow in your home. The river that is flowing in this church is the river that wants to flow in your house. Somebody say power. power. See, as they pray and they broke bread from house to house, they begin to multiply the environment. They begin to multiply the environment of the upper room in every believer's home. I believe that these homes are different than the homes you see today. I, I've got to talk about it because I think when we talk about groups and we talk about life groups, a lot of times we build these groups for lonely people. We say go to a group so that you can make a friend. Go to the group so that you can make a friend. Go to the group so that you can connect to the church. Go to the group so you can go ahead and you don't have to be so lonely. I think it's wrong. What I believe is you should go to the group because the power that's in the service is the power that's in the group. Because if you tend to the fire and you tend to revival and you tend to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will take care of everything else within your life. You know what I want to do right now? I want to do today, man. I want to start starting some house fires. I believe that the desire of fire is not only supposed to stay in the house of God, but the fire that is in the house of God. It is a new season, and the fire wants to fill your home. The fire wants to fill your living room. The fire wants to fill your bedroom. The fire wants to fill your backyard. I came to tell you God wants to light your house on fire. I'm going to say it again. God, the spirit of God wants to light your house on fire. When, during the times of the Azusa Street Revival, when they were praying every day and miracles are being done, the, the history tells us that as people drove by the house, they drove by the place they were meeting, people said it seems as if the entire building is on fire. When people drive by your house, when people drive by your home from the outside, it's going to look like your entire house is on fire. Someone say fire. fire. Someone say power. power. That power wants to fill not only your life, that power wants to fill your home. Because where there's fire, there's a tension. Where there's fire, there's curiosity. All of a sudden, your house again is going to catch on fire through prayer. And neighbors you never met going to start bringing cookies to your house. Neighbors you never met. I never met you, but here's some tamales I made. Come on, somebody. 
Don't think it's strange, brothers and sisters. They're not trying to meet you. Your house is on fire. They know there is power in that house. The power of deliverance. The power of salvation. The power of healing. The power of restraint. Can I get anybody in this place that understands when the Holy Ghost begins to fall on your house? Come on, shouts. Come on, give me a Pentecostal praise. Somebody say amen. Because God is about to light your house on fire. Play softly. And when, and when they come with those tamales. Invite them in. Say, won't you come in? And you watch. Watch the good. They say, oh, okay, praise the Lord. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to come in here. But when they come in, what are they going to feel? What are they going to see? What are they going to sense? I believe that when they come into your house fire, they're going to feel the power of God that changed you and changed me. And I want to tell you that there's been a prophetic word over our church. A prophetic word has been spoken. And a prophetic word was spoken to me a number of weeks ago as we've been praying. So many things have been happening in the spirit realm. And I don't have time to tell you everything because we have another service. But I want to tell you that prophetic words are flowing out over you, over our church. And someone said to me who was here, who's been praying with us and praying for us, but right now a lot of people are praying with us. They're praying with us. They said, Victor Outreach San Diego is at a tipping point. A tipping point. A tipping point is a quiet buildup of something that can no longer be hidden. Everyone say tipping point. A tipping point is a quiet buildup of something that can no longer be hidden. When we had that concert with Phil, I was on this side of the platform and I just laid down and I began to just lay prostrate before the Lord and I had my ear to the stage because I said, God, I want you to speak to me. You know, it's in times like this where God will speak. God desires to speak. And as I put my ear to the platform and I was just prostrate as he was singing, ministering, worshiping, I heard the Lord say to me, this is what you asked of me in January. Now, I know some of you hadn't been here. You weren't here in January, but a lot of you were. And in January, we dedicated every Wednesday night to prayer. And every Wednesday night, we'd come in and we would pray. Who remembers? We were praying. We prayed for five months. And then my daughter says to me, Samara, the pastora, she says to me, Dad, are we going to continue to pray on Wednesday night? Because don't you think... We need the word. And I said, Lord, through babes and sucklings, will you speak? Because how many know to have a fire, you need some wood? So I believe God used her in that moment. But then from there, we went into a season, a hard season. Things begin to happen. There was shifting movement. And as I'm putting my ear to the stage, and you could feel the tangible presence of God and people breaking through, the Lord says, this is what you asked of me in January. And he says, have I not done it? He said, all the things that you 
mourned. This is what God told me. In that season, it wasn't the devil. It was me moving it, moving it. He says, because I had to unclog the pipes. The other day, our sanctuary flooded with water. The first rain that came, it was flooded all the way, the whole entire sanctuary. Many of you don't know this. When they went up on the roof, they said it flooded, Pastor, because all the rain gutters were clogged. Where there's a clog, water can't flow effectively. So God says, I had to remove and burn away the clogs. When those clogs were moved, guess what? Heaven was open and the fire got me. Come on, give God a praise. What is God doing in your hearts? He's removing the clogs because you are at a tipping point and God is getting ready to use your life. God is getting ready to pour out a fresh anointing. I believe that some of you are going to be activated in the spirit realm. And it's been prophesied. The spirit of revival is God saying, behold, I am doing a new thing. The spirit of revival is saying, behold, this is so important. Behold, I am doing a new thing. I am not giving you new wine. I'm giving you a new wine skin. I'm not putting a new patch on an old garment. I'm cleaning out your closet and I'm giving you a whole new wardrobe. That's revival. It's okay to change. It's okay to change. And so revival wants to burn. There, there are two things I want you to do today, and then, and then I'm going to pray over you. I have an assignment today because there's a shift happening in your life. Number one, there's a shift from being, in, from being watchers to being worshipers. That shift's happening. That shift is so strong that I come into these service and people no longer just stand there and watch. Right, Mark? I walk around the back and I see people in the back singing. So that shift has happened. Someone say shift. So God is taking you from being an audience to being an army. He's also shifting us from pain to power. Those of you that have been in pain, he's going to teach you in this season how to turn your pain into purpose and power. Your pain is going to become your pulpit. And as you speak, People are going to be delivered. As you speak, people are going to be set free. <laughs> As you tell them how God has delivered you and healed you and shifted you, they're going to sit under the sound of your voice and the fire that is in you, it's going to come out of your mouth. And their spirit is going to be ignited. And he's shifting you. Look. From survival to revival. Listen. You will no longer say, I am barely making it. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. You can bless your life or curse your life. And what comes out of your mouth is God has shifted me from pain to power, from watching to worshiping, from worshiping to warring, from an audience to an army. He has shifted me from survival to revival. 
I'm not the man that I used to be. I'm not the woman that I used to be. I'm not the preacher that I used to be. I'm not the leader that I used to be. I'm not the young person that I used to be. I have changed. God is doing a new work in me. Say, neighbor, you shifted. And now the shift goes from God's house to your house. And today, this entire day, there's going to be activation in this service. Things that were dead are going to come alive. Things that were sleeping are going to wake up. Gifts are going to be stirred. Passions are going to be rekindled. Burdens are going to be released. Can I hear an amen? I need you to do two things. How many want to be a part of this shift? Put that slide back up now, please. Number one, I need you to go to the table today. And I need you now to get into koinonia. I need you to come close. I need you to come close to your brothers and sisters. I need you to get in what is a house fire. Now, we were calling our life groups, city life groups. We're changing the name to house fires. Everybody say house fires. And what I want you to do before this service is over, in fact, after this service, you're going to go to the table. You're going to put your name on a list to do one of two things. Either join one of the house fires that you see listed here. We have about 30. But we need more. I want you to be in a house fire because what you learn in that home about prayer is what you'll be able to take to your home. And I believe that these are going to be training grounds for prayer, discipleship. So I need you today to sign up for house fire if you're not in a house fire. The second thing I need you to do is I need you to put the next slide up is if you sign up for a house fire, I need you to purchase a copy of my book. Now, this part, I really felt like, okay, this is, this is, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, sell books here. This is not my intent. But I want to tell you about this book. It's been selling all over the world. It's sold out in Africa. People from Europe are buying it. People are buying it from all over the world because of the platform that I've been given. But here's what I want to tell you about this book. I did not write this book for Victor Arch. I wrote this book for you. I wrote it for you, and I mean that with all my heart. Now, I, I want you to clap. That's cool, but that's not really what I care about. I need you to understand the purpose of this book. I wrote this book because I need every person who walks into this church to connect with me and to connect with my wife. I need you to connect with us when it comes to what's being conveyed about your destiny. We want every person who comes into Victor Art San Diego and gives their life to Christ to on day one, someone say day one, connect with the heart God has given us for your destiny, for your personal destiny. This book, as you open it, you're going to hear our testimony, how we got saved, how we met. You're going to hear the process of God in your life. You're going to hear about things we experienced in our life. And this is only chapter one. I'm already working on my next book, which will be a second part to this book. But the point that I'm making is I need everybody in this church to have this book. I need you to have it. I need you to have it. There's a purpose in this book. It's not to sell books. I'm not trying to be an author. I'm not trying to be a famous person on, you know, the New York Times bestseller list. You know, I don't want anybody going out and say, oh, our pastor wrote a book and our pastor. No, no, that's not the purpose. This purpose is for discipleship. Discipleship. And I need every person to understand that if God has called you to this church, it's because... He has a purpose for your life. So today, here's what I'm going to do. One day only, <laughs> I'm going to give you a discount on this book today. If you sign up to be in a group. Imagine, all you have to do is go, give your information, sign up to be in a group, or sign up to lead a group. You say, I want 
to build a house fire. I want to be the lead of a house fire. I want to build a group. If you do that today, I'll give you the book on a discount. And they have all the information. I, I can't discount the books because I'm paying, for the, I'm paying for these books. I'm making these books for you. I'm printing these books. So I need to be able to at least break even on what I have spent. But the purpose of the book is to get it in your hands, get it in your life, and build, help build you to be the person God has called you to be. Everyone lift your hands today as we begin to ask the Holy Spirit to fall. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit right now. Lord, you're already stirring our hearts, oh God. The fire that is here is the fire that you want to release into our homes. I come against a spirit of division. I come against strife in the home. I come against strife in the heart. I come against unforgiveness. I come against arguments, disagreements, God. I come against those things that try to bring division in the home. Lord, I pray that healing would be released. Lord, if there's any root of bitterness, let it come out this entire day. Begin to uproot bitterness out of the lives of people, people who have been through struggle, people who have been through battle, people who have been through betrayal. Father, I pray that you would begin to uproot, tear down, plant water, and build up again. Father, I speak new life. I speak new life. I speak new life. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I feel your power. I speak new life. I speak new life. I speak new life. I believe God is activating your heart. God is activating your heart. If you're here right now, you're here right now. I don't want that song. I want Yahweh. If you're here right now, I want you to come to this altar, and I want the Spirit of God to begin to touch you and activate your heart right now. There's a spirit of activation. I want members to come. I want members to come.